Hey everyone, it's Irene, and today I'm really excited to be chatting with Tony. Tony is an activist, an author, and a proud Black trans woman. And I've been meaning to ask her a little bit more about her life and how she came about to writing this book about her transformation. Um, so thanks so much, Tony, for being on the channel today. Thank you, Irene, for having me. Happy holiday. Happy holidays. Um, so Tony and I met at the SF LGBT Center. So the SF LGBT Center is a really amazing nonprofit that does a lot of different services. Maybe do you want to share a little bit about what you did while you were there at the center? Absolutely. Um, hi everyone, I'm Tony. I was the interim director of employment services, uh, working with the SF LGBT Center in San Francisco and working with Rebecca uh, Roof, who is the executive director there. Um, they had a seven month gap between their previous director and they had looked for a director, but COVID came along. So Rebecca asked me, would I come in as interim while they did a search through a search firm called Rockham um, to find a director. And I was there for uh, August through December of this year. Um, I just recently completed uh, my tenure last Wednesday. And what we did was find employment and help people get employment uh, services, resume building, job finding for people who were looking for a job, uh, working with all types of employers such as US Bank and Accenture and other employers who were looking to find people for jobs. And it was yeah. really exciting. And now they have a wonderful new director by the name of Cheryl Lala, who's permanent. I am out and she's in. And congratulations to her. Yeah, it was awesome being able to meet you. So I've been volunteering at the center for a while. And um, I remember when you first joined, I was like, oh, there's a new person here. Um, and we were able to kind of see each other during the job coaching hours. For those who might be interested, they have drop-in job coaching um, where I volunteer as a kind of a job coach, helping people with their resumes, helping people with interview prep, maybe giving them some suggestions on what kind of careers are good potentials given their background and their interests. So it was really awesome to meet you there. Um, I've been reading Tony's book. I'm about halfway through Tony's book right now. And I just was very impressed by kind of all the different life experiences you had. So I wanted to just bring you on the show and kind of introduce people to you and, and kind of share your story. Thank you. Yeah, do you think you could share a little recap of kind of your upbringing and then how you kind of came to, to be <laughs> at the SF LGBT Center? Sure. Um, um, I'm from originally Jacksonville, North Carolina. Um, I'm a Southern person. I was raised by two religious parents. Uh, great parents, uh, but very religious. We went to church three or four times a week. Um, I was a good student. I got a scholarship when I graduated Jacksonville High School to go to Wake Forest University, an ACC school in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, I completed that, but during that time, I met a very special woman named Dr. Maya Angelou, um, who's now passed, but she had a poem called I Rise, um, and I met her. She was a Reynolds professor professor there, uh, African-American Reynolds professor. Um, and uh, that poem kind of stuck with me throughout the years. I rise, no matter what obstacles come, I rise. So I went on and became an assistant to a dean at a community college in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I was working in education. But I wasn't complete. I wasn't a whole person. In fact, I was living an unauthentic life. I was very unhappy. I was doing well uh, in graduate school, but I wasn't who I wanted to be, who my inner soul was calling. I was born an African-American male in North Carolina, but I've always felt that I was a different bird of a different feather, um, and I always felt that I was a woman. So during my time at the college, Wake Technical Community College under the wonderful Dr. Robinson, I started transitioning and then found out North Carolina isn't a great place to transition. There's no doctors, what, 25 years ago that really knew what was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, they were like, what? You want to do what? You want to do what? So I moved to New York and I, I worked there for a while. And then I started transitioning and then found out uh, my health insurance was running out. My money was running out. My family had kind of put me on my own journey. Um, and I found myself on 14th Street in the meatpacking district 
which was the uh, prostitute district. The girls were three blocks up, the transgenders were three blocks over. So it was like, if you want to date, trans or female, <laughs> there we were. And I worked with some girls, um, I worked with an Asian female, a, a black female. Then I worked with a, a black trans and started working with other escorts in order to make money. And yeah. I did that for a while um, as a street prostitute and met some wonderful celebrities, which uh, I don't mention in the book, but I met some top-notch celebrities who were African-American, who were big movie stars at that time, who had picked us up and showed us a good time. And, um, and that's how I really got transitioned. I was uh, uh, working with most of the girls out there, didn't even have a GED or high school diploma. Um, they didn't believe me when I said I was almost finished with an MBA. I was like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I had applied for 150 jobs once I transitioned. And I couldn't even get a job at McDonald's flipping burgers. I went in that day and said, hi. His name was Jack. He said, hi, Jack. And uh, uh, he said, uh, okay, you want a job? And, you know, I had long grades and so forth. But when I popped my ID out, it said male. And Jack was like, um, you have the wrong ID. And I'm like, no, that's, that's the ID. Because it wasn't easy to get your ID to change over to female in 1999. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't happening. So, um, and he said, oh, we don't have an opening. I said, Jack, I'm in the back flipping burgers. Then you have me sweeping. I mean, really? You can't give me a job being in the back. I don't even have to be in front of the customers. They wouldn't even know, but I'd be in the back. So he wouldn't give me a job. And after interviewing for marketing and McDonald's and Burger King, I realized nobody was going to hire me as my new self. So I worked a while and became, then I, I started advertising on the net and becoming a more high-end um, escort, working with females and transgenders. And we traveled to Canada, all over the place, making lots of money uh, at that time. So um, I went from a street prostitute um, um, and unable to get a job, because I did want a job. I really didn't want to be a prostitute in all actuality. But when you can't get a job and you have to eat and sleep, you do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. So I did what I had to do and was taught by some of the best prostitutes in the world. They were very good at what they did because I had no clue of that world. I didn't even come from that world. I've never been in the street. I didn't never, you know, work till five in the morning in high heels. And it was just new to me. And um, I learned how to do it. And then I started working professionally with other professional escorts and we became a mistress and I worked with masters. We started seeing really rich people and it became a different life. And uh, that's how I got in, made my transition. I made my transition as a prostitute on the street of 14th in Manhattan. That's really how I made my transition for the first two years. I was a whore, old term, I'm old. Um, they call it sex worker now. Some people may say, oh my gosh, she said whore. I was a, a sex worker. And uh, that's how I got my beginning, as a trans woman and as a uh, sex worker. I paid for my uh, breast and you know, laser and facial stuff and all kinds of stuff. Just from working on the street at night, avoiding the cops. And half of them were my clients as well. <laughs> If they wasn't arresting you, they wanted a date. So, you know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing some of the things that you've been through. Um, definitely recommend people check out your book. Um, it's called I Rise, The Transformation of Tony Newman. Um, and there's just a lot that maybe if people aren't exposed to this world, they don't realize all of the difficulties that, you know, all of the barriers, whether it's like your own family or financial barriers or medical barriers, just to kind of live in the body that you feel comfortable. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Uh, how did kind of how did you transition out of kind of the professional sex work world into some of the nonprofit work that you do? Because you do a lot of um, activism relating to sex workers' rights. Um, in Lyric, the organization that you're working at now does a lot of amazing work for LGBT youth. Like, how did you get that transition into this new area of kind of community work um, and community organizing? I, my first job 
post-sex work, was working for a marketing company, uh, asking people, do you like uh, Newman salad dressing? Would you like to try some today? We have crackers and bread and so forth. And then would you like some sausages? We also, blah, blah, blah. So I was a marketer for a marketing company working in your Ralph's, your Vons, your grocery store, selling items that were just coming out. Um, and then I heard Equality California was looking for uh, people to help raise money for marriage, LGBT marriage. It had failed in California the first time and we were going on the ballot for the second time. So I went down to apply as a EQCA, Equality California canvasser, and we stand outside your grocery store and say, do you support LGBT rights? No, screw you, you're a dummy, you lesbians, and I was with lesbians and gays, you faggots, you whores, whatever. And it was amazing, it was amazing. I worked with 22 awesome people who were out there and we raised millions hundreds of millions of dollars, and we got the marriage the second go round. So once I did that, I started getting into healthcare for LGBTQ and went to THE, a uh, healthcare clinic, and became their coordinator and then director of development. Then I moved to San Francisco to work for Maitri, the AIDS hospital serving people who were dying of AIDS um, as their director of development. And um, I applied as the ED CEO of St. James, the sex worker clinic. It is the only sex worker clinic in America. Um, um, and um, here we are. And then from there, I went to the center, SF LGBT Center. Um, and from there, I landed at Lyric. So I've worked for five nonprofits, but my beginning was a marketing company asking people, do you want to buy sausages? Um, and would you like the crackers to go with it? And how would you like me to serve it to you? With the cracker or without? Uh, is how I really got started. And people would stop by and, and people were hungry and I knew they were going to buy. But it, was a, it was a job. It was my first job as a trans woman, non-escorting, was being a marketer, selling Newman dressing, sausages, all kinds of shit. It was amazing. And I met some really cool people. And one of the people who I met said, you should go to EQCA. They're looking for people who can communicate well. And you, you had me buy this sausage. You're a really good communicator. You should get down there. So I said, okay. They called and said, I'm coming. I went down there. These were lesbian and gay, predominantly white. Um, no trans, but lesbian and gay. And here we are. Um, I worked for EQCA for almost two years, raising money to get marriage to be voted yes in California. We were one of the first states to get marriage. And I was part of that. So that was my beginning. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I do remember when we finally had marriage equality here in California, and then later it was reversed, of course, with Prop 8, and then we lost the right to marriage, and then we got it again. Then we had to fight again. That's when I joined the battle, when mm -hmm. it, it, it got it, lost it, we're going to get it back, we're going to put it on the ballot. I joined it at that time uh, with uh, John O'Connor as our CEO, and it was mm -hmm. great. It was great. And we raised a lot of money to get marriage on, you know, to, to, to win. It. So it was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned in your book that you had started out um, studying sociology as well. Well, you started out um, in interest in medical field and then switched to sociology. Do you feel like maybe some of the background you had um, in school helped or was it primarily some of your lived experiences and how you had to navigate you know, being a black person in the United States, being a queer person in the United States at a time when, you know, things weren't as accepting? I must say, I went to uh, Wake Forest under pre-med and after I failed chemistry and biology, it became apparent I wasn't going to be a doctor. Uh, I was so unhappy at that time. So I switched to sociology under Dr. Katherine Harris, who's now retired, but she's fabulous. And a lot of the stuff she taught me was really instrumental going down the road. The Wake Forest years were very good years because I met Dr. Maya Angelou, her poem, I Rise, and Dr. Harris. So yes, the question to that is, uh, sorry I couldn't make it as a doctor, it just wasn't gonna work, but the sociology part really became applicable to my life because I was pretty screwed up and it, it, it teaches you how to uh, analyze yourself, analyze others, learn people, cues, 
you know, it's about behavior. And I realized I was unhappy because I was not living, doing the behavior that I really wanted to do. I was living a very unhappy life for not being true to myself. Um, so I changed my behavior, of course, uh, and start living my authentic life, which brought poverty in the very beginning. But uh, I've never been happier. So 25 years later, it was tough the first 10 years. But the last 15, they've been pretty good. So the story is, be your true self. That's the only way to be happy. You can have a great job, but if you're not being true to yourself, you, you're doing yourself an injustice. Mm -hmm. So that's my point to everybody. I became my true self, and yes, I became a prostitute, and some people frown on that, and an escort, and a mistress, aka whore, sex worker, but it led me here so that I can really be a true activist to sex workers, to people with AIDS, to children who are abandoned. I understand what it's like to be poor, abandoned, without love, and feeling alone. And that's what I think makes me a good activist. I've been there. Mm -hmm. I've kind of walked through their shoes and I see what they see, you know, and I know that they can do it if they want to make a change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think you could tell us a little bit more about Lyric and Lyric's mission and maybe how um, you personally feel like connected to these people? Like uh, the Lyric does really amazing work. Um, there's so many great nonprofits that are around here, like in the Bay Area, just across the whole country, really, that are focusing on this specific area where people might not get that support from their family. Unlike a lot of other issues where maybe your family might be going through it as well and you're all kind of working together, this could be a thing that can really you know, leave you to be abandoned or not have um, you know, social or financial support from your own family. So maybe you could share a little bit about Lyric's mission and, and the organization. Uh, so, yeah, I'm the interim executive director and president of Lyric. And Lyric is a, um, the mission basically is, is to build community and to inspire social change through education, enhancement, career training, health promotion, and leadership development. Um, and to help the youth and their families with trying to progress forward. Um, we are about 70% uh, youth of color. Um, and I think that's why Lyric was looking for a person of color. Uh, Jody um, had been their executive director since 2003, um, and she's retiring. And since Lyric has now turned into a lot of youth of color, uh, we wanted to have a leadership team that reflected the youth that we serve. Uh, Black, Asian, Latin, Indian, a lot of people of color, of youth, um, and uh, a lot of trans as well. So I think that's where I came in handy by being a person of color and also trained and had, you know, two years of being a previous CEO before of a similar organization, but dealing with sex workers. But some of the sex workers were over 18, but they were youth. Um, I think that's why Lyric and the board kind of selected me for my background and for what, I, for what I've been through. And uh, Lyric is, a, is, is doing great work working with you. We work with Larkin. We also work very closely with the SF LGBT Center. I just mm -hmm. sent someone over there last week. Kudos to them. Um, and Larkin, who's also a youth housing um, a, um, for people under 24 as well. Larkin and Lyric are the main two youth organizations geared directly towards youth under the age of 24. That's amazing. Um, yeah, they do a lot of great work. If people are curious and you're listening to this, feel free to check out Lyric.org. Um, that's where you'll be able to find out more about Lyric, Lyric's mission, and the work they do. Um, and then I guess kind of going back into kind of you sharing your story with your book, like how did that come about? How did you end up writing a book? And I know you might may be working on a second book. Um, so how did you even come about to the decision of writing this first book? I um, uh, got a partner in 2004 uh, on the end of the uh, um, escorting and mistressing. And um, they said, you should start all these stories you tell me. They're crazy. You should write that down. So I went out and bought 20 yellow pads and just started writing this shit down. And I started writing I was where I was born and how I was born in North Carolina and Wake Forest. And when I looked, 
I had about eight pads completely filled. And uh, I said, maybe I should get an editor. So I, I had a friend who recommended Kevin Hogan, who at that time was a professor of English, I don't want to get it wrong, at Boston University. Um, and uh, I met him and he read all of my pads. And he said, we've got a book here. And I'm like, how much? And uh, he said, I can become your editor. And for months, he and I would work after work at night. He had a job during the day, but at night we'd work and email each other and working on the book. And before we knew it, we had the book. And then he said the title. And I said, the poem I Rise from Dr. Angelo is amazing. He said, I rise. The transformation of Tony Newman, because you just transform yourself from A to Z. And I'm like, okay. So that's how the book got written, and that's how we came up with the title. Um, uh, kudos to Dr. Angelo uh, from her poem, I Rise. And that's how we, the book came about. Um, and, um, um, and, and then we began to send it out, and we got a publisher, and, you know, it, it went okay. And so you just kind of started writing because you were, you know, well, you know encouraged had, you know, yeah, to, to do you know, it? My partner said, you should write down all this stuff you've been going through. Um, and I just started writing on yellow pads and then realized this is a book. But I'm like, well, how do I put all this together? There are like eight yellow pads here with all kinds. I mean, it was just all mumble and jumble. It went from birth to New York, but back to Jacksonville. And it was like, my God, it's all over the place. So I sent all the yellow pads to Kevin, um, um, who's an English professor. Um, and, and he said, okay, let's just start with chapter one. And we pull up that little yellow pad and, and, and that's how the book began. Wow. So did you mail them over to, to him? I or? did. I did. But he was at that point in Santa Monica. So mm -hmm. we met the first time and the first couple of meetings, um, it was in person, but then he moved to Boston, I think. And then we started emailing each other, um, and sending stuff through the mail. So it was great. I gave him all the yellow pad. I say, read this. If you think this is a book, let me know. He said, this is a book. Pretty interesting um, on where you came from and where you are today. You should let people know, what you, what, how, you, know how you overcame. Mm -hmm. And I, that's, that's how it came about. And did you get, you, you mentioned you got connected to Kevin through like a previous connection or? Um, you know, to be honest, that, that was, I met Kevin in 2006. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Somebody introduced me to Kevin and his lovely wife. God, I can't remember her name. She's a real lovely woman. Um, and we met in Santa Monica at Starbucks. Wow. And I that's where that it all started. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> met at Starbucks. Starbucks in Santa Monica, not far from the pier. But I forgot how I met Kevin. Somebody told me, and I think it was somebody from Santa Monica College. Mm -hmm. So this guy's a pretty good, or some, somebody gave me his name. Mm -hmm. And then we connected. And then my partner and me and him and his wife met. Oh, we, would, oh, and then we left there to go have a real drink, some coffee. And uh, that's how it all began. And Kevin was my editor for the whole book. Mm, he that's was really amazing. good. I, I, I paid him and he was worth every dime. He's a great editor named Kevin Hogan. You need an editor? Uh, I recommend it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then did he help you figure out where to get the book published? Because um, this is both He did. He sent it out a lot of places um, and, and, you know, a lot of places. So, you know, that's just, you, on that, you just send the manuscript out and you hope for the best. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you never know who's going to take it. You send it to LGBTQ folk. But back then, there wasn't as many LGBTQ publishing houses as there are now. This was back 2011. Chad Bono, Cher's um, son, now daughter, our mm -hmm. books came out a week apart. Uh, he transitioned from female to male, mm -hmm. and I transitioned from male to female. And we both had a book coming out within six days of each other. Uh, um, and, and that was pretty interesting uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's really awesome that somebody like believed that you know you can make this book and then you just wrote it and then but if he just said, somebody... this, this sounds like crap i probably would have never published it because i had doubts in the beginning even though i wrote it i wasn't sure 
So that word of encouragement to make me feel like this is a great story was really kind. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I give him big kudos for helping me editing it and getting it out. Mm -hmm. He was a big, big help. And, and you need a great you're... editor. Don't try to write your book, <laughs> uh, folk, by yourself. I don't care if you have MBAs and law degrees, all of that. You need a real good English writer who knows the language and he can take a sentence and really express it the way you want it to. Mm -hmm. And he did that because um, mm -hmm. I was just writing it direct. And he helped me to tell a story, chapter by chapter by chapter, beginning to, to the end. And that's mm -hmm. what you need, someone to edit it and help tell the story. So an editor is really important. It's not cheap, um, but you know, it, it was worth it, it was worth it. Yeah, and, and what are you thinking about doing for this next book? I know, you know, this book is out and it's been out for, you know, almost, 10 years mm -hmm. um and it's i think even some sometimes the terminology kind of changes between then and now because before like different terms within you know the lgbt umbrella people would be like oh you know don't refer to people as this or that and nowadays it's more socially acceptable to say this and we use so, you these know terms. the thing is don't say whore don't say prostitute say sex worker mm -hmm. and i'm like what's the difference but that's just the over the years, it's come to be sex worker, mm -hmm. where back in the days, 20 years ago, we called it your prostitute. Mm -hmm. You an escort, um, you know, but now it's called sex worker. The new book will be just about how to overcome and achieve. Um, I, I want to let people know, you know, just because I came from a background of sex work and so forth, that you can still, uh, you know, do great things. Don't let that define you. Mm -hmm. You know, I did it out of necessity. And most of the people of color that I knew don't do it because it feels good. They do it because this is how I make money. Mm -hmm. That's changed as well. Uh, all the sites that used to be up to, to advertise, they're not up anymore. So that whole game has changed. So in, in the last 20 years, in the last 10 years, Craigslist is no longer a, a place for sex work, which it used to be. Um, all those things have changed quite a bit. So the new book is going to talk about uh, where I am today. Mm -hmm. Being a Black trans woman and working with Mayor Breed to get the first transgender housing program in the country started with St. James and uh, her and the Board of Supervisors awarding us $2.3 million mm -hmm. uh, for trans TGNC housing. It's going to talk more about positiveness and how to channel all of your thoughts into something positive. How can you be the best you? Mm -hmm. Don't let people tell you that you can't be a CEO of a $5 million company. It's just not true. If you work hard, dedicate yourself, um, show love, love will come back to you. It takes a while. It doesn't happen overnight, but it, it works. And I'm a living example that hard work, respect, giving, receiving, loving, giving, receiving. It works. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would like to tell my youth. Because the next book about youth who are coming up in a digital area, utilize all your skills. You may not go to college, but you can get a trade. But find out what you really want to do and excel at that. And be the best you can be. Because look at me. Who would have thought 1998, I'm a prostitute on 14th Street. Couldn't even flip burgers for McDonald's in the back. <laughs> he didn't even want me in the building. And I'm like, I'm in the back cooking burgers with a head thing on. You can't even see me. I'm sweeping and taking trash out the back door. Why would you deny me this? But it, just to let you know, anything is possible. Mm -hmm. Believe it. Anything is possible. Anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is that's that's awesome. I uh, look forward to to seeing it. Look forward to reading and kind of having people hear your, you know, what helped you overcome all the different challenges you had, um, and just all the 
difficulties that came with it. I remember um, reading in your book, you mentioned that, you know, there are a lot of drug dealers too, when you're kind of trying to work on the streets and there are just people trying to get people into drugs and being able to find a cheap enjoyment, but is going to be really damaging for you long-term if you're addicted. One of the young ladies I worked with became addict. Mm -hmm. 80 to 85 percent of both female and transgender um they never could leave because they became addicts hooked on heroin cocaine crack uh, all kinds of things which was a quick fix to make you feel better because you know sometimes you feel bad about yourself about who you are in that moment but that is just a quick fix that leads to nowhere fast mm -hmm. drugs are not the answer alcohol is not the answer but only one of the uh, escorts I was working with back then, I communicate with today. The rest are practically uh, non-living. They're dead. Um, and they're addicts. They died of addiction. Mm -hmm. And they were out there to peddle that, knowing, hey, hey, here, I can give you a $20 bag of cocaine. It's cold out here. You want to be warm, right? You know, so forth and so on. And a lot of girls say, oh, that makes sense. But, you know, one day led to a $40 bag, you know. $60 bag. The next thing you know, you're just an addict. You're just a working addict. And then you can't get a job anywhere else because you're an addict. Um, and it goes nowhere. So, um, you know, I made it out of that, non addictive. Uh, I stayed focused. It was hard. And uh, the other young lady became sober, non addiction. She's been sober for over 22 years. Uh, we made it out, but uh, most of them did not. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, they, they died later on through violence, addiction, living a really, really rough life. Uh, and that's sad. But, you know, I, they had to do what they had to do. And they just made a bad decision why they mm -hmm. did it, which cost them everything. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the sad part about it. Yeah. That, yeah. I'm glad to hear there's so many more organizations that are trying to provide like social services. Do you think you could share maybe a little bit about the work St. James does? You mentioned. St. James uh, is the only sex worker clinic. They do uh, clinical services. Um, they have a great uh, um, doctor over there. They have a nurse practitioner over there. Uh, Brianna Singleton is their nurse practitioner, a woman of color. Uh, excellent. Um, if you are a sex worker, former, past or present, it's a great place to go and talk about opportunities, sex work, um, you know, anything of that caliber. You, they are ex-sex workers, ex-masseurs. They understand where you're coming from. There's no judgment over there. They're just really trying to help you get uh, health care. Uh, mental health is uh, popular over there. Um, and housing. So you can get health care, mental health, and housing there. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing. So if you are a past or present uh, former sex worker, uh, look them up, stjamesinfirmary.org. It's an, the only sex worker clinic uh, in, in America. Uh, and uh, it's a great place, great place. Yeah, well, is there, I guess, anything else you feel like you want to share or highlight? Uh, definitely want to plug people check out your book, I Rise, The Transformation of Tony Newman. Uh, many other kind of things that you want to share in terms of maybe the work that you're doing now or? No, if you're youth under 24 and need help, Lyric. If you are a uh, LGBT person needing services, I recommend the SF LGBT Center. If you're a sex worker, you past or present former, I recommend St. James Infirmary. And, uh, you know, I'm just here to encourage folk live your authentic life it may not be easy in the beginning but 24 years later i'm very happy i'm healthy um and things are good so that lets you know i made the right decision it just took a long time to get here and hopefully now it won't take a trans person of color 20 years to transition we have some great organizations like the transgender law center uh, trans lifeline these are great organizations willing to help um, help you, you know, find housing, legal help, name change. I mean, you got so many services now for a trans person. It just, you know, especially in San Francisco. Oh my God, it is trans haven. They are really Mayor Breed has been an excellent advocate 
to trans folk and Claire Farley, uh, director of the Office of Trans Initiatives, special advisor to the mayor. Kudos to her, uh, a white trans woman. These are great services. So if you're in San Francisco, go there. If you're in Los Angeles, where I am, I recommend you go to the LA LGBT Center. They have lots of trans services, housing, and a youth department. So California's got you covered. Northern or Southern, we got you covered here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and do you plan on staying in California just uh, in terms of your foreseeable future? Do you go back to Northern North Carolina? Oh, or? no, honey. Oh, <laughs> no. oh, no. I will be in North, Southern California, LA, um, and uh, I'll be working in Southern California. I lived in Northern California for five years, uh, working for My Tree, uh, St. James. I'm working remotely now, as most people are, with Lyric. Uh, been down there once already, maybe come again in February or March. But no, I'm, I'm a permanent resident here in uh, Los Angeles County. I've been voting here for six, 17 years. So no, this is my home. I visit North Carolina, but never to return as a resident. Nada. <laughs> Nada. Love North Carolina, though. I'm not knocking North Carolina. But no, I wouldn't want to live there in my last 25, 30 years of living. Nada, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, Tony, for coming on the show today. Hopefully, you know, people will be inspired by your story. They can look you up. They can check out your website, Tony Newman. Um, they can find out more about your story, your journey. Um, there's also some really cool photos, both in your book that I think you maybe also have in your photos section of your site where people can even see how you were even in Playgirl magazine. I was a pretty hot looking boy. I, I was not a bad looking boy. <laughs> I've been in about 20 fitness magazines and been in some really top stuff with some of the top fitness models back 30 years ago. So uh, I, I was in one, two, three calendars, all kinds of stuff. I did all kinds of stuff. But uh, that wasn't my authentic self, masking who I was. But yeah, um, it's, it's interesting to see what I look like then and what I look like now. I, went, I go back to uh, high, North Carolina to high school, and they're like, are you Tony's sister? <laughs> I'm, I'm Tony. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I was in math with Tony. You're not Tony. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> this girl named Jessica was like, stop it. You are lying to me. It was crazy. <laughs> we went a whole hour we like, yes, no, no, yes. Tony's not coming. This is Tony. No, no. And then they finally realized, this is Tony? How the hell did this happen? Did you have like a body reinventment thing? I'm like, it was so crazy. It was so crazy. So yeah. 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 Amazing. Well, yeah. Thank you for sharing. I'm looking forward to finishing the rest of your book. People want to check it out. It's um, available on Amazon on Kindle, uh, which is where I'm reading it. Um, but check it out wherever you can find it. And um, it's on lots of book sites. So it's all over. You can get Kindle for $9.99. You don't have to buy the hard copy. Most people are reading it through their iPad, phone, and computer now anyway. So uh, feel free to get it for Kindle for 10 bucks. It'll be a good read. If nothing else, you'll get a giggle. The pictures are, it's worth the $10 in itself to see what I used to look like and what I look like as a mistress. And then I don't even look like the mistress anymore because I now bald, I don't have braids, breast reduction. So, I mean, I had bigger boobs. It's just, you know, I've had like three transformations in my, my life. It's almost crazy, you know, playgirl model, mistress and now activists they're three different looking people none of them look like any of the other ones so it's kind of like who the hell are you <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was a, it was really shocking because i've only seen you now in the activist setting you know yeah, through yeah, nonprofit work the long braids and, and the like, leather oh, and then you can go back and like play girl model fitness model yeah, I used to travel. It's like, get out of here. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah and definitely. And my family's like, oh, my God, how, you've changed yourself like three times. Is this it? People never go, you, you know, when I go back to high school, they don't recognize me. When I go back to some of the people I used to work with as a mistress, who are you? <laughs> and I'm like, we work together. Who? Why? Get out of here. It's like, it's like 
all these different phases, the, the people in those phases don't even recognize the activist, the escort doesn't recognize the activist, the activist people doesn't recognize the playgirl model. It's kind of crazy. And I, you know, I know it is. I mean, I'm not stupid. I mean, I look three times differently over the last 30 years. I mean, completely different. You know, I don't even look like the escort anymore with, you know, my breast has been reduced, the long hair, all the sexiness. You know, I'm more dialed down now. I don't even look like I looked like 15 years ago. So it just lets you know you can reinvent yourself like Madonna said, reinvent yourself. I'm a living proof you can do that. <laughs> yeah, it's totally, yeah. I, I was surprised. I was like, oh, what? That, that does, I had no clue, but <laughs> I'm, I'm proud. Like, I'm proud that you're able to like, be your true self, like to survive basically in a world that is so tough and difficult for people who don't really fit in these, you know, narrow confines of what society expects us to look like or act yeah. like. So that's, you know, that's amazing. So I tell your audience, Irene and I just want you to be your authentic self. That's the whole name of this game. Whoever that is, let it step out. You will find love somewhere. There's someone out there ready and willing to accept you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Glad I did it. Glad I did it. Glad I did it. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming on the show today. You're Everyone welcome. can check out I Rise, The Transformation of Tony Newman. And hopefully I'll keep running into you again in some of our um, nonprofit and social organizing, community organizing work in the future. Um, take care and have a good rest of your day, everyone. Happy <laughs> Bye -bye. All day. Signing off as always. Deep breath in together. Deep breath out. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Take care.